Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a uh, gentleman that you've come to see, and I'm excited to hear talk. Please welcome David Silverstein, everybody. I'm on a little bit of a, a mission these days to inspire people, to inspire people to uh, think differently, to use their brains differently, to think about how they take care of their brains a little bit differently. Curiosity is something that comes up a lot. Today, it's one of the the most valued qualities of a, of a new employee. It's a quality a characteristic that companies are looking for in their recruiting process. They want to know that people are curious. They want to know that people are going to be seeking out answers. So I think it's a, it's a really important topic. It's not just about um, those of us who are misunderstood. We're trying to figure out, and when I say we, I mean you know, business in general, how do, we, how do we test people's curiosity? How do we measure it? We haven't figured that out yet. What I do know is that being curious is starting to, to demonstrate that it is far more important than even being really smart. See, when people are really smart, they think, hey, I'm really good at connecting the dots. I can do that. I can solve problems. I can connect the dots. But what do you need to connect the dots? What do you need? Dots. You need dots, right? Before you can connect the dots, you have to collect the dots. And so it's the person who's got all the dots, who's got the information. They've really got the power, right? You know that old saying, information is power. And so there's a, there's a lot of very smart people out there, but they're not very curious. Uh, so we call them, what do we call them, book smart, right? But they don't have all the information they need to connect the dots and come up with an interesting ideas. So here's another topic that I'm often misunderstood on. Global warming, how's that for a political hot button in Colorado, right? <laughs> people think that I don't believe in global warming, when the truth is, I'm actually certain the globe is warming. I'm even pretty sure that man is a big contributor to it. So why do people so misunderstand me and think that I don't believe in global warming? It's because I'm always talking down all the solutions that I'm hearing to it. I think we've got it all wrong. I think we need to be focusing on things like innovation and adaptation and maybe in some places even migration. But it seems all the politicians and bureaucrats of the world want to talk about is behavior modification. Right? When has that ever solved a problem on a global scale? We're going to get everybody to change their behavior. Right? It's not going to work. So I believe in global warming, but I don't believe in the solutions. And why is it that the world's politicians and bureaucrats are always trying to change our behavior? Well, I think it's because they lack the ability to imagine a future that looks very different than the world we live in today. Right? They lack the ability to imagine the possible. Now, notice I didn't say impossible. You ever hear of some great story about somebody achieving the impossible? I've never known anybody to achieve the impossible, right? Because impossible is absolute. Right? Why would anybody pursue something that they think is impossible? That's crazy. So what really is the difference? What is it that people do that achieve what you thought was impossible? They think it's possible. That's really the difference. Nobody has ever done the impossible. So the challenge we have is, how do we start to think that more things are possible? We got any, uh, yeah, we got a few people close to my age in here. We got, got any uh, Trekkies in the room, old Star Trek fans? You can just kind of go like this in front of you so nobody else sees your hand go up. You don't have to really admit it. So if you had to pick one thing on the old Star Trek series that you thought was really impossible, what would it be? Say, say, it, say it louder? Transporter. Yeah, the, the, the transporter, right? Beam me up, Scotty. Which, by the way, do you know there's not a single episode where anybody ever says, beam me up, Scotty? Not, not one. A little trivia for you. But anyway, yeah, the transporter. So back in the year 2000, William Shatner, who was the original Captain Kirk, uh, he was, he's a curious guy. He's a self-proclaimed, intellectually curious guy. He's the first to admit he's not an engineer or scientist. He said, I don't understand any of that stuff we talked about on Star Trek but I'm actually really curious about it. So in the year 2000, he partnered up with a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and he went and traveled the world, and they went around the world interviewing other great scientists all around the world. And they said to them, where are we today with respect to the technology that we talked about back in the 1960s on Star Trek? Right? They had the phasers and the tricorders and the transporter, and even traveling at the speed of light, mathematically, we know how to do it. We don't know how to do it in practice yet, but we know how to do it mathematically. The one thing that all of the scientists said would never be achieved, now this is the year 2000, mind you, was the transporter. 
So isn't it interesting that it happened for the first time in 2008? It happened at Cal Berkeley. Now, they don't call it the transporter. They call it teleportation. Teleportation uses a, a quantum physics principle called uh, quantum entanglement. I, I studied physics in college. I was a, a nuclear engineer in the Navy, and I don't understand quantum entanglement. Uh, Einstein understood it. He called it spooky action at a distance. Quantum entanglement talks about how two particles can basically be connected over vast distances uh, without any contact between them. And a change in one instantaneously faster than the speed of light causes a change in the other. So here the world's greatest scientists say it can't be done. It's done for the first time in 2008. It was done again in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark at a university. Most recently it was done at, the, uh, at a university in China for the first time with macroscopic particles. They're now experimenting with organic matter, RNA, which is the building blocks of DNA, to see if, see if that will stay intact. And yet, the greatest minds in the world in the year 2000 said, impossible. Now, an important fact for everybody to know is that there was an episode of Star Trek where they let us know Dr. Emery Dickinson invented the transporter in the early 22nd century. That's about 100 years from now, right? We're in the early part of the 21st century. So let me ask, is there anybody in the room that is willing to say, it's impossible that we're going to be doing that 100 years from now? I know that I'm not. I, I've learned to conclude that there's almost nothing that's impossible today. Things that we say are impossible five years later are being turned into reality. Not 100 years later, five years later. It's absolutely amazing. So the ability to believe, that, that's what we really need. To solve the world's problem, we need to believe that those problems can be solved. And if we did, we'd be going about global warming in a completely different way. So I share the, 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 the transporter story with you because I think it's a, a very telling one. And there's a lot of cliches out there about the non-believers, like the head of the US Patent and Trademark Office back around the turn of the last century, about 1900, saying, you know what, we don't need to change the system and come up with more numbers because everything that ever will be invented pretty much already has been. Or the CEO of Digital Equipment Corp in the late 70s saying, why would anybody ever want a computer on their desk? Meanwhile, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs were in Steve Jobs' garage building a computer to put on your desk, right? So it's, it's amazing what happens when we start to open up our mind and believe that things are really possible. So let's talk about that computer for a minute, because the computer is really the, the greatest gift to the curious that has ever existed. But let me ask you first, what does it take to invent the next generation of computer, the next generation of microprocessor. What do we need? We need the current generation, right? So we invent a faster microprocessor, we make a better computer. That helps us design and model the next generation of computer that much faster. So computing power is this exponential force because computers are used to invent computers. And we're only at the bottom here of this exponential growth curve. I mean, think about it. We didn't even have computers in any major way until the 60s and 70s, right? Started tinkering around with them a little bit in the, the 40s and 50s with vacuum tubes and that kind of thing. But we're just at the dawn of the computer age. I don't even know if they're gonna be calling them computers in the future. But the technology's going like this. Those computers are an incredible gift to the curious because they enable us to have endless information. You know, it used to be, it's Sunday morning, you're sitting around the house, sitting around the fire in the winter, you read the Sunday paper, when you're done reading the Sunday paper, you're pretty much out of things to read. Maybe you've got a novel that you picked up at the library, but that's it. If you're curious, what did you do? The library is closed on Sunday, you're kind of done, right? In the, with the advent of the computer and the internet, we have this unlimited amount of information. It never ends. You can never consume it all, and you're never going to run out of places, right? You can go find the answer to anything. So in, in one of my new books, uh, it's called One Dot, Two Dot, Get Some New Dots. I know you were drinking before, uh, before you came in here, so we just call it dots. Um, I talk about the importance of curiosity and some of the things that we need to be aware of uh, to really fuel our curiosity. And I know this one's going to sound really simple, but the first one is we've got to read a lot. Now, I've had people say to me, you know, Dave, I I've got my own style of learning. I like to watch videos or I like to listen to uh, books on tape on my way to work. All good. But if you want to be a voracious consumer of information, there just is no substitute for reading. You have to read and read and read and read. Reading has several advantages that you just can't get 
anywhere else. First of all, reading is an active process, right? You have to engage with whatever it's, it is you're reading. In a book, you have to flip the pages. On the internet, you've got to click the next link. You have to kind of follow it with your eye. If you miss something and you find yourself, you ever find yourself three pages later, and like, huh, I don't know what I've read the last week. What do you do? You flip back and you read them again. If you're watching something on television, you can rewind it, but how often do you rewind the news and say I missed something? You don't. You just, it's a passive process watching the news, where reading a magazine is very active. So you have to read a lot. Reading is self-paced. When you're listening to something, the speaker paces it for you. When you're watching something on television or you're watching a video on YouTube, the, it's paced for you. But if you can keep up with the closed captioning or you can keep up with the subtitles, then you know you are actually capable of taking information in quite a bit faster than that. Reading allows you to take information in much faster. And reading is one of those things you can do anytime, any place. Right? You got your phone with you all, your, all the time. You got time to kill the dentist, whip out your phone. I mean, how many of you have done this yet? Because it's a fairly new thing to actually read books on your phone. Good, I, that's actually great that, that people are starting to do. You know, just a year or two ago, people were saying, oh, the screen's too small, I can never do that. And I used to say, really, you read your email all day long, right? Is that screen really, so when I read a book on my phone, it's, it's I, I actually prefer it. In fact, there's some new research that says reading on a phone is solving problems for some dyslexics. Because, and, and I'm not dyslexic, but dyslexia comes with different forms of getting confused about what it is you're reading, right? Too much information. And so the phone really narrows the field of view. An, an example I use in my book of the importance of reading, and reading not just trade journals and, and things relevant to your business, but having all kinds of sources of information, is a guy by the name of Ryan Juni. Ryan Juni was an electrical engineer, I guess he still is, and back in the mid-2000s, he's reading about a salsa dancer he was reading in Business 2.0, a, a magazine for small business, and he's reading about a salsa dancer putting together some videos and putting them online and selling them for a few bucks, a few bucks each in order to teach people how to dance. And he said, that's brilliant. Now, it doesn't sound so brilliant today, right? But this is back around 2005, 2006. Nobody was doing that yet. You had never heard of YouTube in 2005. Google hadn't bought it in 2005, right? Google didn't buy it until about 2008. Seems like we've had these things forever. It was just yesterday. So Ryan Juni created a system called Omnisio. It gave people the ability to very easily create their own videos, edit them, mash them up, and that type of stuff. Sold his business for, for tens of millions of dollars a few years later to, to Google. But his idea didn't come from reading about electrical engineering. It didn't come from reading about the, the business of the company he worked for at the time. It came from reading a magazine and reading about, about a salsa dancer. And so we have to have all kinds of sources of information. You never know where that next idea is coming from. I'll tell you where it doesn't come from. It doesn't come from kids going off to college, taking classes in entrepreneurship, and then sitting around a table and brainstorming, what business am I going to create? And let me, let me go take another class on how to raise money. That never, ever works. It comes from people who are out there reading about the world, seeing the world, um, experiencing the world. And that's where ideas come from. So, Reading is really important. Probably the, the tool we most associate with curiosity, intellectual curiosity, is just asking questions. You know, you've heard it. Anybody have a five-year-old child or grandchild or has had one? Right? Why, 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 why? Right? We think it's cute, it's adorable. In fact, if it's your first kid, you're amazed at how smart their questions are. Right? By the third kid, you're not so amazed. <laughs> right? But it's, it's cute and, and it's, it's valued when a kid does it. But what happens when you go say, why, why, why to your boss, right? How, how many whys do you get to ask your boss? Maybe one before you get the, why are you questioning me? Or do you think I don't know what I'm doing? Right? Why, why are you asking that question? Right? When did it not become cute? When did it not become acceptable to answer or ask, I should say, a lot of questions, right? We have to never stop asking questions. What we really need to learn is to be on the receiving end of the asking and to not take it personally, not feel like we're being challenged, right? We need to say, that's terrific. You got some more questions? Let's, let's go. Um, but for some reason, we don't ask enough questions. We get stifled as adults. Um, Ken Langone. Ken Langone is a guy that did not get stifled asking a lot of questions. Ken Langone was the founder of a company back in the 1980s called uh, Invimed, investment bank. And he had a reputation for asking literally thousands of questions in the course of 20 minutes. When he'd go in and look at a business that he wanted to invest in, he would go talk to everybody from the CEO to people on the shop floor. He'd crawl under trucks and inside machines, right? He didn't know what he was looking for. 
he's just going to keep asking questions until something interesting emerges. And by doing this over and over again, he learned to trust himself. He learned to trust that if he filled his head with lots and lots of information and kept asking questions and kept gathering, that the answers would come to him. So an investment was brought to him. Uh, somebody wanted to, him to invest in a new chain of hardware stores. Now, the investment had been, already been offered to uh, billionaire Ross Perot. Ross Perot was already a, a big-time billionaire. Uh, Ken Langone just ran a small investment banking firm. And so Ross Perot had a team of financial analysts and young MBAs to look at investments, and they looked at the industry and said, look, there's a hardware store in every corner, in every town. Low margin business, I means selling hammers and nails. It's crazy. Who would ever want to get into that business? Ken Langone, on the other hand, said, you know, this, this Bernie Marcus guy that wants to start these, you know, I'm a little spit. He just got fired as CEO of a company called Handy Dan Home Improvement Centers. But he said there's something about the guy. He's like a warrior. He's never satisfied with anything. He's always asking questions, always trying to make things better. So he figured, well, I can still go to Handy Dan's, and I can go talk to all the employees there. It's still, they're still going to have his, his fingerprints on there. So he went out, and he talked, and he saw what an amazing culture these Handy Dan uh, Home Improvement Centers had. And he put just $100,000 into this new company called the Home Depot. Jump ahead today, that $100,000 is now worth over $2 billion. So Ross Perot and all his financial analysts working the numbers, they said, no way. Ken Langone, asking 1,000 questions in 20 minutes, said, this is a great investment. And he's a billionaire for it. Sometimes you have to relax. That's what Ted Nirenberg was doing back in the 1950s when he and his wife went to tour Europe. Uh, Ted Nirenberg was, a, was an engineer living here in the United States. They went to the, the Hanover Fair in Germany, big industrial fair. And he's walking around, and he was really surprised. He saw all these booths showing off stainless steel flatware. And he's scratching his head and saying to himself, that's really odd. You would never see that in the U.S. Stainless steel flatware is really boring. The only place you'd find it in the U.S. is in school cafeterias, maybe military mess halls. And he said, you know, why don't we use it in the U.S.? In the U.S., uh, even back in the 1950s, e even a lower uh, income family was still using silver on the dinner table. Silver you had to polish, but that, that's all there was, and it's all anybody wanted. You passed it down from generation to generation, it's all about, it was all about the silver. So, but they're on vacation. So Nirenberg, he, he just one of those natural things that come, he asks questions. Uh, their next stop was Copenhagen, Denmark. And there, they're visiting an art museum, modern art. I don't know, well, now we would call that historical art in the 1950s, but it was modern art back then. And he, he sees in a display this teak wood and steel uh, cutlery set. And he thought it was beautiful. And he said to himself, well, why can't we make stainless steel look like that? So he saw the, the name of the designer on the display. And uh, I'm sure his wife wasn't happy about this. Anybody ever get in trouble for working on vacation? Uh, but anyway, so he, he decided the next day that he was going to seek out this designer. And he hunted down Jan Kiesgaard, the designer, and said, listen, can you design these for me so that I can make these out of stainless steel? And Kiesgaard said, impossible. Something that beautiful has to be handcrafted. Uh, canceled their next stop, which was London, said to his wife, look, honey, we've got to stay here in, in Denmark. I've got to keep working on this guy. They spent literally a week. And he kept going back to this guy over and over and over again. Finally, he talked him into coming back to the States with him, starting a company called Lennox to make stainless steel flatware. So all of your flatware today, you know, the stuff you use, your everyday stuff, it looks nice, it's got designs. It, it, it all comes from Ted Nirenberg just saying, why can't we combine this and that, right? Connecting the dots. He got his dots in Germany, he collected some dots in Copenhagen, and, and he connected them and said, why can't we do this back in the United States? So even when on vacation, you know, you get curious, your wheels are just turning, always collecting information. And, and that's a really important quality of the intellectually curious. Being intellectually curious is like growing a muscle. There's research that says you can grow your curiosity like a muscle. So you know, part of this, I say I'm on a mission to inspire people, I, I want to inspire adults and, and, and kids alike. My kids will come to me and they'll ask me a question and I'll say, I don't know, and they'll say, oh, okay. I say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. If you were interested enough in the answer to that question that you were going to waste my time asking me, then get your butt over there to the computer and look it up, right? And so you have to actually teach yourself to be curious and not to, not to take not knowing something for an answer. And what happens is one answer usually leads to five more questions. And that's how you start to grow your curiosity 
like a muscle. And over time, you start to develop an intolerance. And usually we want to develop tolerance, right? Over time, you start to develop an intolerance for not knowing the answer to something, and you want to go find it. So, so that's the, the first book I wanted to talk about. I'm going to talk a lot faster about the second one. second book is called Become an Elite Mental Athlete. So after we become a lot more curious and we're really consuming all of this information, what we've got to do is we've got to start to train our brains to really do great and amazing things with it. So Become an Elite Mental Athlete is, is a metaphor. What I did was I went and looked at what do, what do elite athletes do to train themselves, and why don't elite thinkers do the same kind of things for their brain? So what do I mean? So take an elite athlete like a LeBron James. LeBron James doesn't just say, you know, I need to get better at basketball. First of all, he says, I'm the best in the world, right? But yet he goes out every day trying to figure out, how do I get better? He works on his vertical jump. He works on his fast twitch muscles. He works on his endurance muscles, right? He works on his shot. He works on his dribbling. You know, he actually has a private coach. The team doesn't pay for it. He pays for it himself. They call this guy the hoops whisperer. He's really half psychologist, half coach. And the first day LeBron James went to work with him, he, mind you, he's already in the NBA, his coach said, you know, your dribbling sucks. He said, what do you, what do you mean? I'm, they're, they're telling me I'm the best in the world. He said, yeah, you got a great shot, and you play really great defense, but for the best player in the world, your dribbling sucks. He's got LeBron James out there with two basketballs, like we do with high school kids, learning to dribble two basketballs at a time, blindfolding them, teaching them to dribble with a blindfold on and that kind of stuff. LeBron James just doesn't say, let's go out and play some pickup ball today to get better at basketball. Well, the equivalent of saying, you know what, let's go play some pickup ball is the Fortune 500 CEO who says, oh yeah, I exercise my brain. I do crossword puzzles every Sunday, and I like to do uh, an occasional Sudoku, right? That's like LeBron James saying, I'm going to go out and play some pickup ball today. It, it doesn't really make you better. So, if you're an elite thinker, you make money with your brain. I tell the people who work for me that you know what you really do when you come to work every day. What you're really doing is you're renting me your brain for eight hours a day. You have an obligation to me to make sure that brain is the very best that it can be. What are you doing to make it better? So we actually exercise our brains in our company. But think about this. Uh, think uh, Hussein Bolt. Everybody know who Hussein Bolt is, right? The lightning bolt. You know, supposedly right now maybe the fastest man in the world. Hussein Bolt can tell you exactly what he eats the night before a race. Exactly how many ounces of chicken and of fish and what type of fish. He goes to bed at a very precise time, gets a very precise amount of sleep. When he starts running that race, he knows exactly how many strides he's going to take before he lifts up his head to see where he is. It's about 20 strides that he can afford to take with his head down before he's at risk of crossing into one of the other lanes. And he wants to keep, right? So how many times did he have to practice that just to figure out how far can I go before I can pick up my head, right? The equivalent for that Fortune 500 CEO is, I'm going into a billion dollar negotiation today. And instead of being out relationship building last night, right, and coming to the negotiation at nine o'clock in the morning with a hangover, you know, the right amount of sleep, the right nutrition, it makes, if I can recall one thing in that meeting that I might otherwise not have, if I can pick up one nuance of what that other guy across the table from me had to say, that could make or break whether or not I make a good billion dollar deal or a bad billion dollar deal. That's what it means to become an elite mental athlete. Thinking about how we train and treat our brains the same way an elite athlete trains and treats their body. Most people don't really understand what goes on in their brain the connection between exercise and the brain, the connection between nutrition and the brain. So I'm also trying to inspire people to say, you know what, for the last oh, 30, 40 years now, ever since all the, the diet fads started and then the exercise fads, we've been doing a great job of doing more and more to take care of our bodies, right? We got Michelle Obama's gonna make sure we all eat better. And if you live here in Colorado, you're a runner or a biker, Right? So we do a lot of things to take care of our bodies, but very few people do anything to really take care of their brain, and it makes a world of difference. Thank you very much. Really, you can use the bathroom now.
Q and A. Yeah. So, um, I, well, Dave will be out here. I, for I can I, 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 I can answer questions. Sure. Yeah. You got to turn the cameras off then. Oh, um, well, those are private. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Sure. Does anybody have any questions? Am I tired? Do I look tired? Are you working on a new book? A little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I'm not tired. I, I find it invigorating to get up there. I'll, I'll crash in an hour. How do I train my brain? So, let me get up here. So, so how do I train my brain? So first of all, at, at BMGI, at, at our company, um, we actually get everybody a license, and you've seen the ads for it, uh, lumosity.com. So we do that, but that's not the only way to train your brain. The reason we get everybody an account there and we encourage them to use that is it's kind of like when a company says, you know what, we're going to supplement your gym membership for a while uh, because we're going we're to try to get you started on something. Over time, you start to decide what your own workout routine is, right? You decide whether you like biking more than, uh, more than running or if you like to do, I guess we don't call them aerobics classes anymore, but you know the classes, whether you like to do yoga. But first of all, we try to get people started. Uh, and then there's all kinds of tools and software out there. Um, there's, you know, I talked a little bit about reading. So who'd have thought that in 2014 we would actually be learning new things about reading? You think we've, we've been, if there's anything we've been doing for thousands of years, it's reading. Well, there's been all kinds of new research just in the last dozen or so years just into reading. For example, there's a new software out there, this app out there. Scientists have figured out that every word has the equivalent of a, a center of mass. It's got something to do with the syllables and that kind of thing. And if the software will just subtly highlight that, that letter in the middle, that equivalent of the center of mass, your eye focuses on that word just uh, literally, because we're talking a word, hundredths of a second faster. But collectively, over the course of reading a page, it, you start to read much, much faster when you're reading with this software because of what it does to the word. Um, there are uh, there are apps out there for if you want to work on your reading speed where you actually uh, have settings. It's kind of like going to the gym and changing the weights on the barbell or turning up the tension on the bike. Uh, the settings are things like how many words at a time do you see? You start with one and it's scrolling for you. Then you open the field division up to two, and three. How many lines do you want to see at a time? One, two, three. And so you start reading and you read with that. And you can do your regular reading with those, with those apps. And then over time, you're, you're training yourself to read faster. Um, you know, I, talk, I make a big point of talking about uh, the connection between short-term memory and long-term memory in the book. A lot of people don't understand that uh, short-term memory is critical to long-term memory because if you don't have a good short-term memory, then uh, you don't store things to park into long-term memory when you go to sleep at night. That's when things usually get moved into long-term memory. Uh, I also say get an intellectual hobby. So for me, a couple of years ago, for example, um, I took up the study of Mandarin. Now, I told you before that we shouldn't think anything's impossible. I thought it was impossible for me to learn Mandarin. Uh, I studied French for five years between middle school and high school, and I can't speak a word of French. Uh, so when I went out to study Mandarin, though, I said, you know what? I'm an adult now. I can design my own training program. I don't have to learn the way my teacher told me to learn back in high school. And by putting together my own program, I actually learned it much, much faster. I did it very intensely uh, for about a year. I still remember just about everything two years later. But I'll tell you this, after about three months, I could notably measure using different apps. It made a huge difference in my memory, uh, studying a language as an adult. Uh, there was a great article in, in Wired Magazine just a few years ago where Wired Magazine talked about the, uh, what their prediction for what the new core competencies would be that we teach in universities in the future. So there's you know, math and science, reading and writing and so on, right? the core competencies. They put on their list cognitive science. They see cognitive science as a core educational requirement coming in the not too distant future. Because if we don't understand how our brains work, then we can't really maximize the potential of what we can do with our brains. A lot of um, who I am today came of my uh, experience. I spent seven years in the US Navy. And people always say to me, so Dave, you probably learned a lot about leadership in the Navy. And I say, no. And I saw just as many poor leaders in the service as I saw good ones. Uh, but really, the most important thing I learned when I was in the Navy is I learned how to learn. I mean, the way the military goes about training people, the amount that you have to learn and retain and get good at, 
you really, really learn how to learn. All right, well listen, thank you, uh, thank you everybody very much for, for coming tonight, and thank you.